Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Simon Lewis and what I was hoping to do here was produce a video that would be useful for people living with Parkinson's disease, so patients, their carers, their partners, their family, and anybody really uh, who has some skin in that game. And what I'd like to do is just give some practical tips, uh, some ideas about what might cause Parkinson's and things that you can do uh, to try and improve your quality of life with Parkinson's. And as you can see, uh, I've captioned this uh, Living with Parkinson's, a, a survivor's guide. And really one of the first questions that people ask me when they uh, get diagnosed is, why me, doc? You know, it's obvious with things like heart disease, if you're eating the wrong diet and you're drinking too much or smoking, you think, well, that's why you might get heart disease. But with Parkinson's disease, it's really important to realize that actually there's nothing you've done that has brought this on yourself. And I think there's a lot of stigma to brain diseases uh, all around the world. And the first message for today is, there is nothing you could have done uh, that has brought this on. There is nothing you could have done that would have stopped this from happening. I think these are important messages for you. The second thing I say is things could be much worse. I know it sounds terrible when people get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but there are other diseases, other conditions that are far more devastating in the way that they affect people. Because in actual fact, Parkinson's disease is generally quite slowly progressive. And of course, we have a number of good treatments that can relieve symptoms in Parkinson's these days. And then the final message I want to hammer home is you actually don't get to choose whether you have Parkinson's disease or not. The only thing you actually get to choose is how you react to having Parkinson's disease. And with any condition, the truth is the more positive you are in your outlook, the more you're likely to have a better course in your disease. People who retire into their shell or feel like a victim of their disease generally do poorly compared to people who say, okay, doctor, I hear what you're saying. What can I now do that will improve how my Parkinson's goes? So people are often asked a bit about what is Parkinson's disease? And we use these clever terms, a neurodegenerative disease, a common disease of the brain where what we mean is that parts of the brain are dying. And it's specific parts, and I'll show you that uh, in the next few slides, but it's essentially a pattern of cell loss. Not all of the cells in the brain are dying, but specific cells, and that accounts for why patients have specific symptoms. Common is uh, bounded around, and how common is common? Well, when people reach retirement, at least 1-2% to of them will go on and get Parkinson's disease. It's commonly realized that Parkinson's is associated with aging, and the commonest age to get diagnosed with Parkinson's is probably in your late 50s or early 60s. But it's important to realize that, of course, it's not a disease that uh, only affects the elderly, and it's fair to say that about 5% of all cases are under the age of 40. People often wonder, well, you know, does it vary around the world? And the answer is no. It's uh, about the same degree of uh, prevalence around the world, whether you're in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, near the equator, it doesn't matter. There are slightly more men with Parkinson's than women, but very slightly, and we don't know why that is, whether there's something protective about the female hormones, we're not sure. So I mentioned those cells dying in the brain, and there are lots of populations of cells that produce chemicals in the brain, and I'm showing you a cartoon here of the brain. And those cells that are most important in Parkinson's disease are the ones that produce a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is a, a neurotransmitter, a chemical that makes things happen in the brain. And its action is across physical and non-physical domains, so memory and mood, as well as movement. In this cartoon, you'll see the substantia nigra uh, labeled there. It's a black structure. And the, reason, the reason it's black is that dopamine is on the same pathway as melanin. Melanin is the stuff that gives us pigment in our skin. So it's interesting that we see these black cells deep in the brain stem. And in Parkinson's, they're the cell population that takes the biggest hit, and they start dying off slowly, even before people first present to the doctor with symptoms. And when that happens, what uh, occurs in the brain is that you lose the dopamine, not in that part of the brain, but in the red part, right in the middle that you can see in the cartoon, that we call the striatum. And this is very, very clear, right in the middle of the brain. It acts a bit like a switchboard in the brain. And therefore, all of the signals that help you to move or to think have to go through that area. So when you lose dopamine in Parkinson's disease, you actually get impairments across a range uh, of these functions. As I mentioned, dopamine is probably the most important of the chemicals in the brain that go missing, but not the only one, and I'll touch on some of those a bit later in the talk. 
The next question that people often ask me is, well, Doc, why do the cells die? And the straight answer at the moment is, we don't know why these cells are dying. People have suggested a number of things like genetics, factors in the environment, and also infective type processes that I'll tell you a bit more about in the next few slides. Genetics is a big question because people always wonder about genetics because they worry that perhaps they're going to pass this disease on. And the truth is that there are a number of genes, maybe a dozen or so, that have been described that can cause Parkinson's disease. But they account for a very small number of the cases that we see. Probably less than 2% of cases actually have a gene that we can identify on a blood test that says, yes, this is why you've got this disease. And those families that have that gene often look very different to the most of the Parkinson's patients we see. They'll have a very strong family history, so they'll have um, a parent, an uncle, some children, all across generations suggesting a gene has caused this problem. And the other thing that we see with these uh, conditions that are genetic is a very young onset. So under the age of 30, we would generally say, look, this must be genetic. So we don't think the genes are all that important, but having said that, uh, we know that some of these genes can look exactly like Parkinson's that we see in the clinic, and therefore it might give us some insights as to why those cells are dying and give us some ideas for future treatment. And also, it's, um, it's important to realise that actually some of these genes do sporadically occur, so we actually find these genes in people without a family history. I mentioned earlier in the talk that about 1% of people over the age of 60 have Parkinson's, and it said that about 1 in 1,000 people at large will get Parkinson's. What's interesting is if you talk to Parkinson's patients, about 1 in 10 of them will have a family history, not always very strong, so usually maybe an uncle or a distant cousin, not that same family history you see in genetic cases, but in actual fact, it does seem to be that having the gene in your family does increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. But this is probably not as strong as when you see things like heart disease or breast cancer running through families. So if you have Parkinson's disease, this take-home message is you are very unlikely to pass it on to someone else in your family. We mentioned things like the environment. So people are saying, oh gosh, is there anything in the environment that might cause Parkinson's disease? And we do know that there are some things that increase the risk of getting Parkinson's. But when we increase the risk here and we say maybe it doubles the risk, what you have to remember is that that means that 1 in 1,000 goes to 2 in 1,000. So this really isn't the overall explanation of Parkinson's. So these are risk factors. They might give us clues as to why the cells are dying. And people have noted things like pesticide exposure or living in the country, perhaps drinking well water, as it were, rather than purified water. And things like head injury, significant enough to cause a loss of consciousness. But if you look at all the people that live in the countryside or have had head injury, so very few of them get Parkinson's disease, it's really a very small risk factor. Interestingly, there are also things that reduce the risk of Parkinson's that you may have heard about, and the strongest factor that we've identified from the research is smoking. So in actual fact, people who have been smokers seem to be less likely to get Parkinson's disease, and I used to think it was because they died of cancer or other heart disease, but it does seem that there is something protective in smoke, and we don't know what that is. But whatever you do, please do not take up smoking. The chances of you reducing your risk of Parkinson's disease because you're a smoker are very, very small, and the risks of dying from other smoking-related diseases is very, very high. Also, if you've already developed Parkinson's disease, we know that smoking doesn't relieve your Parkinson's disease or even slow the disease. So please don't take it up. Caffeine has also been noted to reduce your risk of Parkinson's, so if you are enjoying a cup of coffee in the morning, this probably isn't a bad thing, but in a game, it's something that reduces your risk rather than affects the course of your disease. So if you don't drink coffee, you don't have to start going out now and drinking caffeine. The third thing I mentioned was prions, or an infectious cause of Parkinson's disease. And people may not have heard of prion disease outside of things like kreuzfeld jakob or variant kreuzfeld jakob disease. These, of course, have come into the popular uh, media as things known as mad cow disease or variant CJD because of the outbreaks that we saw across Europe. So these diseases are where a prion, a very small molecule, gets into the brain and causes the normal proteins to change their structure. And it makes them abnormal, and it seems to be that that causes brain cells to die. And in Parkinson's, we do see abnormal proteins aggregating in the dying brain cells. 
suggesting perhaps there is something that triggers this, a prion. And a prion might get into your system by eating it or inhaling it. But of course, we have very few, a little idea at the moment as to what it might be in the environment. And of course, it isn't that clear because we have so few cases of Parkinson's disease compared to the normal balanced diet that people are eating. And of course, you know, we're all breathing the same air. So I don't think you should go around excluding things from your diet or wearing a mask to try and protect yourself from Parkinson's. The obvious question that patients ask me is, can we cure Parkinson's? And unfortunately the answer is no, not yet. There are people doing research all over the world and the hope is one day we'll be able to unlock and find a cure for Parkinson's disease, but that is not now. What we do have though is a lot of treatments to relieve symptoms. And these symptoms come as either physical symptoms, the slowness, the stiffness, the tremor, the falling, or things like the non-physical symptoms like mood disorder or sleep problems. And I'm going to talk to you about all of these things. And what I want to start with is what's happening with regard to those dopamine cells and what makes the tablets that we prescribe for patients active and what they do to make the, the symptoms less. So this next picture is a cartoon uh, of the brain cells. And what we're looking at here is a tablet like levodopa, and of course levodopa is a precursor. The brain normally makes this chemical in our brain uh, cells, the dopamine cells, and then converts levodopa, L-dopa, to dopamine and gets released. So when we see patients taking L-dopa, which is probably the mainstay of our treatment in Parkinson's disease, what we see is the cells taking up that L-dopa so that it can be converted within the cell to dopamine and released when it's needed. And early in the course of the disease, we know that patients will have lost somewhere between 30 to 50% of their dopamine cells in that black structure, the substantia nigra. So early in the course of the disease, we actually have a number of these cells left remaining, and that is enough to help deal with the symptoms that patients are getting. So when you take your tablets early in the course of the disease, probably for the first five years or so, they're very effective. They'll maintain the level of dopamine within the brain so that you don't get your Parkinson's symptoms as bad as they were before being diagnosed. The problem comes that as the disease advances, you lose those dopamine cells, which means that at the end of a dose cycle, you don't have enough dopamine in the system, which means your symptoms get worse. So you need to take more of the tablet to get relief. The other problem that we see is the brain is trying to compensate. And these new cells that I put here in yellow are serotonin cells. And these are other brain cells that are capable of converting levodopa into dopamine. So that's helpful, but unfortunately what they can't do is store the dopamine and release it when it's needed. So what happens then is you get a flood of dopamine coming through these cells after you take your tablet, and that's the opposite problem of having Parkinsonism where you're slow and stiff. You actually get too much movement. The body has involuntary, incontrollable, dyskinetic movements. So this is the cycle that we see in patients who develop advanced disease, and we do have some strategies which we can briefly mention. So in terms of treating these physical symptoms, what we're really looking at in Parkinson's is a loss of dopamine and trying to replace it either with something like a levodopa or letting more of the levodopa get to the brain or hang around for longer or stimulate those dopamine receptors. Those are what all our tablets are trying to do. And they generally work well for a few years, as I mentioned, but as those advanced symptoms come in, that wearing off at the end of a dose, and the dyskinesia when you've just taken your tablets, you get these fluctuations. And when patients are in this sort of situation, we need more continuous dopamine stimulation, some of the increased tablets, for example, or things like surgery or pump therapy that can be helpful. Okay. People are very scared about tablets in Parkinson's disease. People are always worried about what are the side effects, doctor. And it is true that all tablets come with side effects. And if you look at something like paracetamol, you'll see that a side effect is headache. So it's quite clear that, yes, a headache tablet can give people headaches. So you have to, you know, weigh these side effects up. And it's fair to say that all of the treatments we have licensed for Parkinson's disease are all beneficial. And those benefits outweigh the harm. So you shouldn't delay or withdraw from taking tablets because of potential side effects. You're more likely to get benefit than harm. Interestingly, it is important to remember as well that none of these treatments accelerate the course of the disease. Patients, I think, have been worried that if they start taking their tablets, 
they, they may accelerate the course of the disease and we have very good data to let us know that that isn't the case. So you don't need to worry that the tablet's going to do your Parkinson's harm in the long term. So when should I start treatment, doctor? That's the question. And the answer is probably when you get first diagnosed because by that point you've already lost at least 30% of those dopamine cells and you've had enough symptoms that have taken you to see a doctor. And at that point you probably need some treatment. And the question then is, well doctor, if I hang on and don't take the treatment, can I, you know, get the benefit a bit later? And the answer is no, because none of these treatments are stopping the cells from dying, which means that you can't bank the benefit. If you have 30% down of your cells now and you start taking the tablets, you've got 70% of the cells that can help. If you wait and go down to 50% of the cells missing, you've only got 50% of the cells that can help when you start taking the tablets. And you can't transfer that benefit. So you're probably much better off improving your symptoms, improving your quality of life, and actually starting to take tablets when you first develop troublesome symptoms. People around the world have got difficulties with accessing medications. I know this, not everyone can have free tablets. And often patients will say to me, well, are the more expensive tablets better, doctor, than the tablets that I might be able to buy that are cheaper? And the answer is, not really. So we do know from studies, recent studies, that regardless of what tablets you start taking at the beginning of your disease, whether it's something simple like levodopa or more complex, rosagiline, selegiline, dopamine agonists like pramipexol, it actually doesn't seem to matter in the long term. People seem to get sustained benefits over seven, maybe longer years, but it doesn't seem to have that much difference. So the idea of saying, well, I need the most expensive tablet right at the start, doctor, probably isn't true. It is fair to say that those newer therapies that we have can have real benefits. And if you look at something like deep brain stimulation in very expensive treatment and in the right patients can of course change the patient's lives uh, dramatically uh, along with the other advanced therapies like the apomorphine or duodopa that we have. But of course they may not be accessible because of cost or licensing regulations in your country. Okay, what about these physical symptoms then? If we're going to talk about tablets, we'll put that to one side. What about exercise? There is no doubt absolutely every patient with Parkinson would benefit from doing exercise. But what's the best exercise or physiotherapy? And the answer is, we don't know. We have lots of studies to say that all of these exercises seem to help, but we don't know whether one is better than the other. What we do know, absolutely, is that doing some exercise or physiotherapy is better than not doing any at all. So you must start doing that soon. If there are specialist Parkinson programs, of course they're tailored to your needs and they are a bit better. What I would say simply is that you need to work on your core strength and your balance. And you can do that just as simply as sitting up from a chair and sitting down. Sitting up from a chair, sitting down. Standing on one leg, holding that balance for a few seconds and then putting the other foot down and repeating. But as with all exercise, just Knowing you should do it isn't going to help. You have to do it. It's like uh, owning some gym or fitness equipment. If you don't go and use it, you don't get any benefit. So you have to do these things reliably and regularly. So you don't need to be in a special facility, but people will need to know about when to start exercising with their Parkinson's. And the answer is now. If you haven't started now, please start. The fact of the matter is, just like the tablets, you can't bank the benefit. If your balance is good now, work with it, try and make it as good as it can be because, of course, those cells will die and you need to be as prepared as you can so that physically you're not disabled later in your disease. This is an easy case of use it or lose it. What about my speech? Another physical symptom. Patients are, are very often affected by speech problems, things like having a soft voice, can't be heard, or stuttering or slurring their words, sounding you know, incoherent so that you can't understand what a patient is saying. And these problems are commonly associated with problems of swallowing, so patients getting coughing or choking when they're drinking or eating. And both of these things, uh, speech and swallowing, seem to be improved by exercises, so speech therapy uh, would be the, the target here. And again, there is no time like the present. The fact of the matter is you want to be able to maintain that benefit and therefore you need to start that training as early as possible to get all of the benefits. If you find that your speech isn't improving, then there are some simple tips like getting a small microphone and a speaker so that at least your family can hear you and understand what you're saying without having to repeat yourself all of the time.
quite inexpensive and will make a big difference at home. What about alternative therapies? My first thing about alternative therapies is do not get ripped off. Financially, do not get ripped off. If you get offered a cure, there's an alternative therapy, someone said to you, rhubarb baths, or having a small electric current pass through your feet. These are not cures. If people are telling you they've got a cure, they're lying, and don't believe them. The questions to ask about these alternative therapies are, is it affordable? Can you afford it? Is it helping? And importantly, is it too good to be true? If somebody says, oh, you do this, and you'll be able to do X, Y, and Z, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, so be very careful. Acupuncture, Pilates, yoga, stretching, dancing, whatever it is, because they're all active, they're all very easy things to do if you've got good support networks, and they're relatively inexpensive and helpful for your Parkinson's. Okay, so leaving the physical now to one side, one of the biggest concerns patients come up with is, what about my memory, doctor? My memory uh, is, is a problem. My memory and my thinking, and it's very common. Patients experience problems with planning or forgetting things, and this is something that is part of Parkinson's disease. We know that at least half of all patients, when they are first diagnosed, have got memory problems. And over time, a number of people do go on to get dementia. So, what can we do about that? And the answer is, well, we know that memory and thinking problems are commonly associated with other symptoms that actually might be treatable, and therefore might improve your memory. And things like depression, anxiety, imagine those things, mood disorders, are going to affect your concentration, which is going to make your memory much worse, and your thinking, planning, all of those things worse. Poor sleep is very common in Parkinson's, and we'll talk about it in a few slides' time. But of course, having poor sleep means your chances of being able to think properly the next day are very slim. And of course, we can target sleep, and we can target mood. What about medications for my memory? Well, the truth is that we probably don't have great medications. Some of your uh, uh, medications that we do have can help a bit, and you can talk about this with your specialist. But they're not going to be the answer to memory problems. So we've covered a number of things there where you might think, well, mm, they sound a bit like I can't do anything about them. But what I would advise you is we're living in this internet age, and there's a lot of terrible stuff on the internet. You know, I found a cure for this, or this is... But you have to cut through that and realize there's actually quite a lot of good useful resource on the internet, indeed, hopefully you're watching this presentation on the internet, and that in itself should tell you that we have some good resources. You can get online and help yourself in a number of ways, and of course this means that they're accessible, and they're generally quite cheap. Things like YouTube, or going to the Google Play, or the App Store, so that you can download these things for a small amount of money. What do I look for, Doctor? Well, you can go to these places and search terms like Parkinson's home exercises, so you can do a home exercise program, or Parkinson's speech training or speech therapy. Even your mobile phone will have a meter inside it, there's a decibel meter, you can shout at it, you can see how loud your voice is going, and you can practice with these things in the comfort of your own home. Memory training. There are lots of devices out there that have memory training games, the Nintendos, the Wii's of this world. Uh, personally, I know a lot of my patients, I recommend uh, the Lomosity.com site, where there's a lot of brain training exercises. For the brain training, what I'd say to you in simple terms, please don't stick to doing what you like. If you like Sudoku, please go and do crosswords. If you like crosswords, please go and do Sudoku or do something that's more challenging so that your brain is tapping into that reserve using what we call neuroplasticity. Okay, I want to turn now to the less glamorous parts of Parkinson's disease because they aren't often talked about because there's a lot of stigma. And I'm going to start with the bowels. Constipation is an enormous problem in Parkinson's patients. At least 90% of patients will experience constipation at some point in their disease. And this is a combination of a couple of things, the poor mobility of the Parkinson patient and also nerve cells dying not only in the brain but in the gut and therefore the gut doesn't work as it should, causing it to slow down and give more constipation symptoms. So what do I do? You said that this was a practical advice session, and the answer is you need to increase the amount of dietary fiber you are taking. So this is things like vegetable roots, and uh, you can see these products, fiber, and, uh, and get those in cereal and, and the like. It is vital that not only do you increase your fiber intake, you have to increase your fluid intake. 
fibre works by drawing fluid into the bowel, which makes the stool soft, and then it allows it to pass. If you're not taking extra fluids, that fibre is not going to work very well, and you'll actually make the problem worse. So you need to increase the amount you drink when you get constipation. Regular physical exercise helps stimulate the bowel. So just going for a walk every day, doing some of these exercises that we've talked about or looking online will help. Routine habits, routine bowel habits, so trying to go every morning or every evening at a regular time will hopefully train the bowel to help you to pass those stools. Do not ignore the urge. If you feel as though you want to go, then capitalize on that feeling and get to the toilet as quickly as possible. And medications, there are a number of medications that you can get over the counter or discuss with your doctor. The key to most medications is please take them regularly. I have too many patients that come into the clinic saying I'm constipated, I took the tablets for a couple of days doc, I'm now not constipated, I've stopped taking those things now and they become constipated again. You're better off with low levels of laxatives all of the time to keep the bowel regular rather than having this extreme I'm not constipated, I am constipated, I am, and this is a bad cycle. So having covered the bowels, it's only fair that we should cover the bladder. So bladder dysfunction in Parkinson's is extremely common. It usually goes along with disease progression. The more you, longer you've had the disease, the more your uh, bowel is likely to be affected. Your bladder is likely to be affected, and it's affected with things like frequency. So having to go more through the day, and often a lot more through the night. Urgency. So when you get the urge, you have to go. There's no delay uh, in emptying the bladder. Hesitation, if you get there and you think you want to go and then you can't pass because the, the muscles are weaker. And also problems like stress incontinence, which of course is associated with coughing or straining. More common in women, especially if they've had children, of course. What do you do uh, if you get bladder problems in Parkinson's? Well, the first thing is to go and see your doctor. Everyone blames Parkinson's for all of their problems. But of course, older men can get prostate cancer, Older women can get prolapse. Both of those things cause bladder problems, and both of them are treated by a urologist, a bladder specialist, rather than a neurologist. So if you like, drains rather than brains. So you need to see the right specialist to make sure that you haven't got a, a problem that can be solved, that isn't accounted for by your Parkinson's disease. The next thing that all of us can do is pelvic floor exercise. We talked about physical exercise, but pelvic floor exercises are, of course, good for all of us. So if you're uh, thinking about how do I do this, well, it's simple. When you go to the toilet to empty your bladder, you stop the flow halfway, you try and count for 10 and see how long you can hold on, and then let the flow go again and see if you can stop it, and really train that sphincter. On top of that, there are a number of pelvic floor exercises that you can do where you're contracting those muscles uh, and you'll uh, be able to again look for these online and see how you would clench the muscles and relax and clench and relax to give them strength. Finally, of course, we have medications to help with bladder dysfunction and this is again something that you can talk about with your specialist. The next symptom I'm going to talk about is fainting or feeling as though you're going to faint, what we in the medical term call postural hypotension. When I stand up, my blood pressure drops and then I faint because my blood pressure needs to get blood flowing to my brain. It's a defense mechanism if you like. And with Parkinson's we know that blood pressure can drop as your Parkinson's advances and we know that all of the treatments for Parkinson's tend to reduce blood pressure. So in actual fact, it may be that to reduce fainting, you'll have to actually reduce the Parkinson medication. And that's something you have to consider. The next uh, trick uh, in treating blood pressure drops is hydration. So you need to again increase the amount of fluid you're drinking and ideally this catch term of isotonic. So as you'll know with rehydrating, dehydrated patients or babies or whatever you've encountered, just having water probably is the wrong thing to do. You want to have a mixture of water with salts and sugars. So you can either get this with you know, some of those flash isotonic drinks, the Gatorades, the Powerades, or very simply with things like a, a fizzy drink that's gone uh, flat, so the bubbles have gone out of it, something like Coca-Cola would be a very good one, or Pepsi, or I don't want to brand anybody here. Um, and also things like the, the mixtures, the sachets that you can mix with water that are relatively cheap, I think like a diorolite that you can mix in and drink. The next thing that you can do to help keep your blood pressure up is to increase the amount of salt you take in your diet. Now it's unusual to hear any doctor say to you, 
take more salt in your diet. Salt's bad for your blood pressure, but of course here, what we're talking about is trying to get your blood pressure up. So adding salt to your food, or even taking a salt tablet, allows uh, the kidneys to retain more of the fluid and allows your blood pressure to stay higher. The next step uh, that you can take uh, after you've used salt tablets uh, is to think about something that's very simple, uh, and that is to sleep with the head of your bed raised by about 30 centimeters, about this much. So you have to wedge it up there, maybe with some books or some wood or whatever, and you basically sleep so that your head is higher than your feet. And after you do that for a few nights, it's an odd experience, but you'll actually find that you have less feeling of being faint the next day. Compression stockings, so the sort of things that you might have on one of those flights, or if you have a surgery that keeps a very tight pressure on your calf muscles, allows more blood flow back to your heart and allows the blood pressure to stay up. And that's simple, and it's okay if you're not in a climate that's too hot. And then of course we do have medications. Again, I would direct you to go and see your doctor about what medication might be useful for treating low blood pressure if you have it. Or indeed, to make sure you're not on tablets that might be lowering your blood pressure. Lots of patients who are on blood pressure tablets and they get Parkinson's no longer need that medication. The next symptom I want to talk about is saliva. So too much saliva. And this sort of spans from waking up with a damp pillow, which isn't too troublesome, to having to have a handkerchief or a tissue constantly at hand because you're literally drooling out of the side of your mouth. What do we do for these problems? Well, we want to increase the swallowing. So basically we want to promote swallowing things like sweets, lollies, uh, lemon bonbons, chewing gum, basically anything that promotes you to swallow the saliva. Some patients have told me that adding horseradish to their diet can reduce the amount of saliva they produce. I don't think it's reliable. And in the clinic, of course, you can again see a specialist and see what medications we have. There are a number of treatments that we have for patients with too much saliva, and again, you can discuss this with your specialist. Not many patients want to talk about depression or mood disorder, anxiety, but it's very, very important in Parkinson's. At least 40% of patients will get Parkinson's, and it is not a reaction to your disease. Correlations between physical severity and Parkinson's depression are very, very low, and we know that Parkinson's patients can get depression before they start getting their physical symptoms. So I think it's one of those things that you have to be aggressive about and accept as part of your disease. Just like losing dopamine, you also lose other chemicals like serotonin, like noradrenaline in the brain that give rise to mood symptoms. And it is just the same. You need to treat those things aggressively, just like you would for your physical symptoms. The depression that we see in Parkinson's is different to people with, if you like, run-of-the-mill depression where patients become suicidal. The suicide rate in Parkinson's is very low. The problems that patients have are often with concentration. So poor concentration uh, makes them feel low in their mood. We have a number of approaches to low mood and obviously non-pharmacological approaches like counselling and uh, using support groups, you know, talking about the problem with people who understand it because they've been in the same position is very helpful. And then of course there are a range of medications and it is fair to say that there are no specific Parkinson antidepressants. All of the antidepressants that are used in clinical practice are effective in Parkinson's and again I would direct you to your uh, specialist to see which one is going to be the best to restore the chemical balance in your brain. One of the biggest problems in Parkinson's that isn't spoken about is sleep disturbance. Again, most patients will have some form of sleep disturbance, things like insomnia, fragmented sleep, can't get to sleep, can't stay asleep, can't get back to sleep. Things like daytime sleepiness, so patients will tell me that they end up sleeping a lot of their day. And interestingly, Parkinson's drugs themselves can make patients more sleepy. So again, you have to look and see whether there's a benefit to treating physical symptoms if somebody ends up sleeping all day. And then an odd thing called REM sleep behavior disorder, which is where patients act out their dreams and they're able to, uh, if you like, fight in their sleep. And about a third of patients will end up injuring themselves or injuring someone they sleep with. And it's a very odd symptom that patients need to know that it's part of the disease. At least 50% of Parkinson's patients will do this. And often I hear families say, oh, you know, my partner now sleeps in the next room, and they'll lie, and they'll say, oh, he moved because I was snoring. And actually they moved because they might have been punched, 
and they don't want to talk about it because there's a stigma. So this is a very common symptom in Parkinson's where patients act out their dreams. They might be talking, shouting, kicking, punching. I'm just going to skip that video there. What do we do about sleep problems in Parkinson's disease? Well, we need to get routine, so sleep hygiene. Do not let people sleep for long periods during the day. Limit their nap to a maximum of 30 minutes. Have a regular time that you go to bed and a regular time that you go out. I have a lot of patients who tell me I can't sleep so I go on the internet and I'm there till 2 o'clock in the morning and then I go to bed and I sleep and I again sleep through the day. It's a very bad pattern and of course there are lots of other things that you don't want to be doing at 2 o'clock on the internet. So I think you need to be very, very strict about your sleep hygiene patterns. You need to avoid exercise or hot baths at least half an hour before you go to bed. Normally what happens overnight is that we drop our body temperature. So if you've just done some exercise or if you've been in a hot bath or shower, the chances are your body's going to find it harder to go to sleep. Patients will actually say to me, Doctor, do you mean I should avoid having sex? Because that can make me more, you know, uh, heated or, you know, generate exercise. And the answer is no. I'm not telling you no that you shouldn't do that. I think that's perfectly fine because often patients will find that they're quite relaxed after that and find it easier to fall asleep. Caffeine is a stimulant, so try and avoid taking it late in the evening so that you can get to sleep. And if you can't sleep, get up. Do some stretching, try and find somewhere comfortable, have a warm milky drink. But do not go and put the television on, do not get on your mobile phone, your iPad or any other device because the light will go into your eyes and it will wake your brain up through the mechanisms that you know, normally we see in the day with our circadian rhythm. The final topic I'm going to cover in this talk is a very difficult topic and that is about psychosis and hallucinations. So what I mean by psychosis is where people might become paranoid and they believe things are happening that aren't really happening. Commonly they'll believe that people are breaking into the house or that someone is stealing things from them or that perhaps their wife is hiding things or changing their tablets or may even be having a relationship with somebody else. These things are all in that domain of psychosis and paranoia. Hallucinations generally in Parkinson's are visual, seeing things that aren't real, which might just be out of the corner of your eye, you think there's something there, it's menacing, or it may be that you actually see people or animals, spiders are very common, cockroaches are very common, so visual hallucinations. And after 10 years of Parkinson's disease, at least 70% of patients will have some of these symptoms. We know that the longer you've had the disease and the higher the doses of your Parkinson's tablets, and also if you're one of those patients who has less in the way of tremor, then you're more likely to suffer with these symptoms. There's not a lot you can do about those things, but we need to be practical and say, well, what can we do? Well, there are a number of things that can trigger these behaviours, this paranoia, psychosis, hallucinations, things like having an infection. So making sure that you, know, you don't have a water infection. Uh, constipation can commonly trigger these things, confusion and hallucinations. And any new medication, it may be that you've had a new medication out of your Parkinson's, or somebody has added a medication for something else and it's interacted with your Parkinson medication and triggered off these behaviours. What else can you do that's practical? Well, we talked about uh, these visual hallucinations and often it's because, just like the, the rest of us, if there's a shadowy thing in a room, the brain tries to fill in the gaps and make something out for you and that may be something like a threat, somebody in the room. So try and eliminate that by improving the lighting have a night light on in the house, so if the patient is getting up to the toilet in the night, they're not seeing shadows, the, the area is quite well lit. Not bright, but well lit, so that they can safely be negotiated. Remove clutter, things like lamp stands, things like low tables that might be misinterpreted by the brain of someone with Parkinson's. And maintain familiar environments. So if you're going to visit friends, this is a really common time if you're staying overnight in an unfamiliar circumstance and it makes it more likely that these people are going to get problems. What about treating it? Well, we do have a range of medications and again, uh, you need to speak to your specialist about these, but also improving your memory can help with things like the hallucinations. So again, that online training. So finally, in summary, I've talked to you about where the disease comes from, how common it is, and also the physical symptoms and how you can treat them with pharmacological approaches and non-pharmacological approaches. The non-physical problems, the non-motor problems, often more burdensome in fact than these physical symptoms. 
often coexisting, so you might be having fainting and hallucinations and constipation. And unfortunately, there isn't one magic tablet that's going to fix all of it. One size does not fit all. So we actually find that sometimes if we treat one symptom, we might make another one worse. So you have to work with your doctors. But the most important thing is that you must not ex ignore these symptoms or ignore your disease. Please do not be a victim of your disease. Please, because there are lots of helpful approaches out there for you. And finally, you'll see in the last slide here is a resource that you can tap into online which will tell you more about these non-motor symptoms that I wrote a little while ago. I hope that this uh, presentation has been helpful to you and your family, and if there are any further problems, please discuss them with your specialists and those people who are close to you. Many thanks for your time.